Welcome everyone. I'm Angeline Terry, a student in the Department of Emerging Media. On behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences, I would like to welcome you to this year's first Teach in Tuesday. Through Teach in Tuesday presentations, the College of Arts and Sciences hope to foster discussion and reflection on social and cultural problems that we face locally and globally. Today's event will begin with a pre-recorded presentation from adjunct history professor Jacob Jers about the role of the Catholic Church in American Indian boarding schools. After the presentation, Justice and Peace Studies professor Mike Klein will moderate a question and answer session. Joining Jacob Jers are Professor Elizabeth Wilkinson, an English professor at the University of St. Thomas, and Father Chris Collins, the Vice President for Mission. American Indian Boarding Schools, the Catholic Church, and the University of St. Thomas. Greetings all, my name is Dr. Jacob Jers and I'm a historian of early North American and American Indian history here at the University of St. Thomas. This past May, at the Catholic-run Columbus Indian Residential School in British Columbia, Canada, the remains of 215 First Nation children were found buried in unmarked graves. Since their discovery, 100 more grave sites have been found at additional schools throughout Canada. While for many non-Indigenous people, the revelations were shocking, for many within the Native community, the unmarked graves were evidence of the trauma perpetuated at boarding schools that they had been speaking about for generations. The history of residential schools in Canada and American Indian boarding schools in the United States is well documented by Indigenous communities and historians. On Indigenous Peoples Day this year, Governor Evers of Wisconsin issued an official apology for American Indian boarding schools in Wisconsin. And in Minnesota, the Duluth City Council unanimously passed a resolution acknowledging the trauma of American Indian boarding schools and calling for a truth and reconciliation process to begin at a federal level. Secretary of the Interior Deb Holland has announced the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative to, quote, shed light on the unspoken traumas of the past, no matter how hard it will be. While Canada has attempted through their Truth and Reconciliation Commission to conduct a full accounting of the history and legacy of residential schools, despite recent steps, the United States and Catholic Church continue to fail to fully acknowledge and confront the impact of this history. Here at the University of St. Thomas, we recently affirmed a land acknowledgement statement condemning the acts of genocide and forced assimilation and dedicating ourselves to truth-telling work. Part of that truth-telling work must be confronting the responsibility of the Catholic Church, as well as the history and legacy of boarding schools in the United States. It is a history of suffering, creating inner generational trauma, affecting hundreds of thousands of people. Children as young as five were beaten, placed in solitary confinement, sexually abused, stripped of their culture, denied access to their families, suffered from disease, and died within these schools. The early roots of the American Indian boarding school system in the United States could be found in the various civilization policy directives, beginning with the Indian Civilization Act Fund of 1819 that provided money for Christian missionary schools to partner with the United States federal government in establishing schools for American Indian children. Forced assimilation policies were furthered by Ulysses S. Grant's 1869 peace policy, which despite its name, used military force to push American Indians onto reservations. While other reservation schools were founded first, the most well-known school was Richard Henry Pat's Carzal Indian Industrial School, established in 1879. Pratt was a military officer who served with the Union Army during the Civil War. He was later promoted and stationed with the 10th Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers, charged with fighting a campaign against southwestern American Indian tribes, including the Cheyenne, Comanche, Kawa, Arapaho, and Apache. During the course of this campaign, Pratt volunteered to bring American Indian prisoners of war to Fort Marion in St. Augustine, Florida, where the groundwork for his boarding schools were laid. At Fort Marion, Pratt experimented with forced education policies on the adult prisoners of war, including harsh military discipline, enforcement of the use of English, 
and other techniques to coerce acceptance of white, quote unquote, civilization. Despite several prisoners dying in custody due to the unsanitary conditions in the prison, Pratt argued that his experimentation with re-education was a success and lobbied for federal permission to expand his program at the Hampton Institute in Virginia and later for a dedicated American Indian boarding school at the old army barracks at Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which would become the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. Pratt's conception of the boarding school came at a time of shifting United States federal policies towards American Indians. Indeed, Pratt's most famous, infamous quote, kill the Indian and save the man, is from an 1892 speech where he states, quote, a great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one and that the high sanction of his destruction has been an enormous factor in promoting Indian massacres. In a sense, I agree with that sentiment, but only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. Pratt's sentiment was seen as progressive by many non-Native American citizens who sought not only to remove American Indians from the United States, but were comfortable in engaging in genocidal actions against indigenous elders, children, women, and men. The insidious nature of Pratt and other late 19th century assimilists was their belief that white American culture was superior to American Indian societies and life ways. They argued the best way forward was the complete elimination of the indigenous society and re-education based on white Christian American values through force if necessary. They did not acknowledge nor value American Indian cultures and societies as equal to white American society and culture, a conception today we recognize as white supremacy. Ojibwe historian Brenda Child notes these re-education policies worked in tandem with policies like the General Allotment Act of 1887, also known as the Dawes Act. The act broke reservation lands into individual allotments and then sold what was termed excess lands to non-native individuals, further eroding tribal land and holdings. Dr. Child notes the school's industrial education model was premised on the idea that students would not be returning to tribal lands, further eroding connections to their cultures and traditions. The early period of American Indian boarding schools represented the worst of forced assimilation practices. Acculturation refers to the combination of two unlike cultures, borrowing, sharing, and fusing new cultural practices. And voluntary assimilation is the willing absorption of the dominant culture by minority groups. Distinct from these concepts, though, is forced or coerced assimilation. And this more closely resembles Pratt's goal of killing American Indian culture in order to quote unquote, save the man. 19th century military massacres at Sand Creek, Washita, and Wounded Knee clearly indicate a willingness of the United States to engage in genocidal actions. Dakota scholar Wazetawin notes that the forced assimilation practices championed by Pratt and the Catholic boarding schools also fulfills the United Nations definition of genocide, including criterion B, quote, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, and criterion E, forcibly transferring children of another group to another group. Both situations occurred within the boarding schools. The first children to arrive and enroll at Carlisle between 1879 and 1890, as Barbara Landis recounts in the Carlisle Indian Industrial School book, were specifically targeted from tribes actively resisting the United States to, quote, ensure the cooperation of their resisting parents and grandparents. Agents working on behalf of the schools went as far to withhold treaty-protected rations and annuities if parents and guardians refused to send their children to schools. Requiring families to choose between sending their children hundreds of miles away or surviving themselves. Wakazal became one of the most infamous sporting schools. It was not alone. Schools were located often hundreds of miles away from children's families in order to dissolve community ties as much as possible. The National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition counts 367 schools in the United States, 80 of which had Catholic ties. 
The trauma of American Indian boarding schools is also present in Minnesota history at 16 institutions, with two of the largest being Morris, a school first administered by the Sisters of Mercy Catholic Order, and the Pipestone Indian Training School. Because there has not been a nationwide accounting, it is unknown how many of these students were forced to attend these schools, though the number is certainly in the hundreds of thousands. The numbers can feel overwhelming, but these statistics represent real individuals. The Zebu Wings Center in Saginaw Chippewa Tribe of Michigan described the arrival at Mount Pleasant Industrial Boarding School thusly, quote, children as young as five years of age arrived by car, train, or wagon, and were immediately told they were, quote, dirty Indians. They were stripped and disinfected by having alcohol, kerosene, or DDT, one of the most well-known synthetic pen pesticides, poured on them. For thousands of children in the late 19th and early 20th century, this is representative of their traumatic beginnings at these schools. Following their arrival, the students were quickly introduced to the harsh military-like discipline of the schools. For many tribes, an individual's hair is not only a marker of identity, but of spiritual significance. And upon arriving at the schools, this spiritual connection was cut short. Their clothing, their personal objects were taken away. And at all times, the children were required to speak only English. Punishments could be harsh and quick for those not adhering to these school rules. And the punishments, they span the spectrum, including forcing students to miss meals, enduring beatings, solitary confinement, and as noted by Zebuwin, it was a common practice to force older American Indian students to deliver punishments to younger students, including both physical and mental abuse. This abuse extended into parts of the educational program itself. Students were often instructed in a trade of one form or another. During the summer, rather than be allowed to return to their families, the children were required to participate in a summer work program in nearby factories or, more often, on nearby farms. From the United States, the 1928 Marion Report, conducted by the U.S. federal government on the state of American Indians, found the boarding schools are frankly supported in part by the labor of students. Those above the fourth grade ordinarily work for half the day and go to school for half a day. The question may be very properly raised as to whether much of the work of Indian children in boarding schools would not be prohibited in many states by child labor laws. In addition to actively attempting to destroy indigenous language, culture, and spiritual practices, the coerced removal of children from their families, the threat and experience of physical and mental violence, disease was also rampant throughout the boarding school system. Early critics of Carlisle noted the high death rate of its students, so much so that, quote, Pratt very deliberately started to send sick and dying children home to die in their communities. The students lived in close quarters with mixed access to medical care and suffered from measles, influenza, mumps, tuberculosis, trachoma, among other diseases. And when the students tried to maintain connections to their families and recount these spirit experiences through written letters, are almost always censored by school administrators. The letters written by the children by their parents could be withheld for any reasons that administrators decided to give. This further isolated the young students from their families and homes. Indeed, some families did not receive word of the condition of their children for years and were often barred from visiting their children. While the United States has not held a full accounting of the legacy of American Indian boarding schools, Canada, which instituted a similar system of residential schools for First Nations students, has embarked on a Truth and Reconciliation Report in 2015 to investigate the history of 139 residential schools that operated from 1883 to 1996. In addition to the goals of forced assimilation, destruction of indigenous culture, physical and mental abuse, the Canadian report found thousands of claims of sexual abuse occurred at these schools, often perpetrated by school officials. 
At residential schools, including those run by the Catholic Church, sexual abusers were not reported to the authorities. They were allowed to resign quietly. They often were able to find work at other schools. It wasn't even until 1968 the Canadian Indian Affairs began tracking the allegations of sexual abuse and began circulating lists of staff members not allowed to be rehired. The Canadian report noted that residential schools were almost always more than simply an education program. It was an integral part of a conscious policy of cultural genocide. And that children were noted to have died due to tuberculosis and influenza, but also neglect, abuse, lack of food, and isolation. Despite attempts to break the spirits of students, some did attempt to resist the authority and conditions present at the boarding schools. Most frequently, students resisted through running away from the schools. However, most were found to return quickly to the schools where they endured further punishment for their actions. Attempting to retain cultural ties, protecting younger children from punishment, and whispering indigenous languages were all acts of resistance to the philosophies of these schools. The boarding school legacy did not end with the closing of the schools. The ripple effects of the schools still echo through communities. Students who survived the schools were often met with difficult choices after graduation. Despite receiving training and education aimed at civilizing American Indians, graduates also encountered race racism the bar to entry to fully assimilate into the dominant white society. And then students who tried to return to their home communities were confronted with a difficult identity crisis, especially those who no longer could speak their community's language, practice cultural traditions, or participate in ceremony. The abuse suffered by some further eroded lines of cultural and social transmission, destroyed family structure, and created cycles of further abuse. With increased knowledge comes the responsibility to act. As a community, we are responsible to each other, and while our actions today cannot ease the suffering of these children, recognizing, acknowledging, and better understanding the past helps us see more clearly our present. Despite the success of survivance of some students to live through their boarding school experience, the schools remain intergenerational sites of trauma, pain, and anguish. Too often in recounting the historical trauma, we could fall into the trap of tragedy tourism, feeling both voyeuristic and yet powerless to affect change. The enormity of the historical human experience could feel overwhelming, but I hope you resist the uncomfortableness of confronting the past. Some have questioned the utility of actions, such as drafting land acknowledgement statements, or questioned what this history has to do with them. For other, the land acknowledgement represents a form of performative virtue signaling. And without concrete change, as a member of a committee, I agree with that statement. It itself does little to address the trauma of the past. Words are powerful only if they inspire action. The statement is a front door of a larger conversation, one you cannot even begin to see if you don't look at that door. This conversation includes discussions of honoring American Indian treaty rights, questioning why there are so many missing and murdered indigenous women, acknowledging the continued legacy of colonization and clearly recognizing the role of the Catholic Church has played in this history. I thank you for your attention today and I look forward to continuing this conversation. And now for the question and answer portion of the presentation led by Professor Mike Klein. As Angeline said, I'm Mike Klein, a Justice and Peace Studies professor here at the University of St. Thomas. As we begin the question and answer session, please send your questions you would like our panelists to comment on into the chat. And to give you, our audience, time to send those questions, let's hear initial responses from our panelists. And let's start with Father Collins. Thanks, Mike. And, uh... And also, first of all, thank you, Jake, for your, for your work on this. And if, uh, you know, as far as initial responses go, even, even some of your last comments in the presentation about how important it is that we resist the desire to flee from an uncomfortable 
uh, and painful encounter and even memories and confronting. And certainly as a, as a Catholic priest myself and as a Jesuit priest who has worked on uh, the Pine Ridge Reservation a couple of times, I could say more about that later. But uh, it's, very, it's obviously very painful, it's tragic, it's, there's sinful history uh, to be confronting. And I think the confronting of history is, is essential for, um, for ourselves personally, collectively as a country, the church too. I mean, the, I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of different versions in recent years and decades, let's say within the Catholic perspective, obviously the, the clerical sexual abuse scandals rampant all over the country in different parts of the world has been an ongoing place of, of pain and confrontation and, uh, and, and recognition of, of the sinfulness that's part of our history within the church and the priesthood too. I just came from St. Louis University. I was there for eight years. I was part of a, a group that was uh, confronting in a, in a deeper way, in a new way, the history of slaveholding by the Jesuits in St. Louis, for example, that was also present in Georgetown and that had a lot of um, attention drawn. And I was a part of a process where, for a little bit at least, uh, meeting and uh, descendants of, of the, the slaves who had been held by the Jesuits too. But, and very painful, very, um, uh, there's a kind of a helplessness that comes with that confronting pain and confronting history. And also how essential it is to, to have personal engagement, it seems to me, you know, um, the, and also that things don't stand out in, in the abstract. Um, I'm going on too long here, but it, I've, I've, got, I've got a flood of memories that are coming to me about even my time on the reservation and, and meeting uh, different Lakota people with a whole variety of perspectives on, on the boarding schools themselves too. So I'm kind of flooded with memories and I'm talking too much. So I will hand it over to Dr. Wilkerson if that's the next okay. move here. So thanks for the opportunity to be here though. All right, well, so uh, I'm also struck with the way that you ended um, the, uh, this um, ask for us to confront our past. And uh, I think, you know, obviously as an English professor, I think story is one of the most important ways. Narrative is the most important way to confront that past. And I think that the way to do it is to read uh, indigenous people's uh, stories directly. And so as early as 1900, we have Gertrude Bonin and Zeke Kalasha publishing in Atlantic Monthly um, a, th a trilogy of pieces, one called School Days of an Indian Girl, and then another called An Indian Teacher Among Indians. And they're accessible online, and we can read directly the words of someone who experienced uh, boarding school and uh, knew and was at times friends with Richard Henry Pratt. Um, although they obviously had very different opinions of boarding school. She went through boarding school and even taught at boarding school, um, but had a very different take on the experience. And <clears throat> I guess uh, another thing that I wanted to think about uh, is the fact that indigenous people in boarding school were finding ways to subvert the system. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important to think about and to know and then uh, as early as 1911, products of the boarding school used that education in order to politically become a, sort of their own indigenous juggernaut, you know, to, to, to try to push back against a system that was, you know, attempting to be genocidal, right? Um, and so we get Gertrude Bonin, we get Charles Eastman, we get even Carlos Montezuma in 1911, creating the Society for American Indians. And, uh, you know, they, they don't all agree with each other, <laughs> right? And, and they're uh, talking about ways of navigating the system in the way that's best for themselves and for their people. And, you know, it's important to read their words. And I think it's especially important to read their words because we still have in uh, the mix non-Native people writing about the Native boarding school experience in a way that is uh, inaccurate and detrimental and romanticizing. And so we get still, My Heart is on the Ground, which is a, a really problematic book, right, for children uh, that paints a very pretty picture of boarding school, right? And so 
Uh, so, so I think it's important to read firsthand accounts from uh, those multiple eras of boarding school in order, you know, as a way, right, to confront our past. And then I think there's also contemporary books that are great that address boarding school issues like um, Louise Erdrich's novel Tracks or uh, The Last Report on the Miracles of Little No Horse um, or uh, Dave Troyer's Res Life. Um, and then finally, I would say like language loss, right? Like was yeah. just such a huge problem. And that resonated as you, as I was listening to your, your talk because that's what separated kids from their elders and, and from hearing the stories that create identity and what's fantastic now is that we are in an era of language reclamation. So that's a fantastic way of fighting back. So that's my two cents. Did I go over time? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wilkinson. And Dr. Juris, do you want to make a comment on these responses? I, I appreciate the responses. Yeah. And I think I'd like to note that you're mentioning reading native authors. Yeah. Um, I'm non-native. I am a white man. That's how I identify. The history that I study is the history of relations between the United States and American Indians. And I think that's an important thing to mention. Um, my extended family uh, is Native American ancestry. My wife is a white earth descendant. Um, my new baby boy is a white earth <laughs> descendant. Language isn't necessarily spoken in our house, though. And there's a longer history in, 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 in my family. But it's tied to this language acquisition, cultural teachings. And so there is this survivance. I, I don't want to say that American Indians are, are disappeared or that there is any vanishing, because that's a, a myth of American Indian history as well. These children resisted. They resisted in the ways that children can, by telling stories to each other, by supporting one another. And that's a part of, of this narrative of American Indian boarding schools as well. But I think that non-natives still refuse to look at this history. The news reports out of Canada noted that folks were shocked, shocked that there were 215 children found buried on this re residential school. And yet Canada in 2015 had gone through a truth and reconciliation process that was national attention. And yet people still claimed that they were surprised. And so hearing that was a deep pain within the indigenous community, within my own family, that folks aren't paying attention. Indigenous people have been talking about boarding schools since the existence of the boarding schools. And there is a spectrum of, of experience there. There are those who had a wonderful experience and who note that as making them the person that they were. But the trauma and pain is there as well. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, non-Native folks have not fully confronted with this history. And so, so much of the current issues that we see can be tied back to this. Because you are breaking down a family structure. You are destroying a language. You are refusing to allow spiritual practices to continue. Children are being raised by folks who are not part of their families. And they're not being taught how to be parents themselves. You can't have in knowledge and transmission of tradition by breaking it down. And so I think a lot of issues that we have today are a result of this active colonial mindset and destruction of culture. And that's why I wanted to bring it up today. I find that important to understand a little bit of this history illuminates at least the pathways forward for how to address issues in our own world. We have so much that we could talk about with the four of us, and we have questions <laughs> coming in from our chat as well. So okay. I want to connect some of what we've been saying uh, to some of our questions from our audience, too. Uh, one attendee says, I feel like I've learned a lot about how these boarding schools were wrong on a social basis. Uh, can you go into more detail about how the church was related to the schools? In what way was the church uh, responsible? For the boarding schools? Sure. It's a part of the, the civilization practices. Um, the most direct result are individual bad actors. Uh, uh, of course, there are numerous reports through the Canadian um, boarding schools report of 
sexual abuse, of physical abuse, um, of taking children away and uh, forcing families uh, to go through extensive channels in order to even see their children. Um, and that was done by the church. Beyond that, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure how much further we need to, to go to say that yes, folks working for the church actively trying to remove indigenous religious practices and forcing only Catholic practices, that's, that's wrong. That's not missionary work. Um, that is destruction of culture, actively aiming to do so. Is it true, um, um, as I always heard the history, that w was it with the U.S. grant policy that the U.S. government assigned different denominations, Christian denominations, to a particular reservation, as, as I understood it, at, at, if that was the right time in history when that happened, which when I was on, on the at Pine Ridge as a novice and, and knowing, hearing that history for the first time, I, I was kind of shocking that the U.S. government, having set up the reservation system, would assign this one would be Methodist, this one would be Presbyterian, this one would be Catholic, and so on. And I, I think that's the, the timing of that policy, right? And so um, the one that I was working on, the Pine Ridge, that had been assigned to the Episcopalians. Uh, the Catholics had been assigned to Rosebud a, a couple counties over. Um, and then in, in that case of the Pine Ridge, that was part, that's part of the history too, is that Chief Redcloud at the time, even though it was assigned to the Episcopalians, he had asked to have Jesuits come because he was aware, I think largely through Father Jasmet, a Jesuit missionary who, who uh, related to a lot, a lot of different tribes. Mm -hmm. they, so the Jesuits, were, in other words, were invited to come by Chief Red Cloud to also set up a school there. Mm -hmm. But just that more structural policy of, of the government determining which geographic areas with different peoples would be assigned to a denomination, I mean, from a Catholic point of view, actually. I mean, it's just horrific that this, <laughs> that the government would be um, implementing this. And as you say, this is not, this is obviously from the get-go, the a kind of a corruption of the, of the evangelizing desire that, that is present at the core of the church. You know, we always want to be engaging people of all, of all different kinds to, to propose what, what the faith is and the reason for the hope and, and faith and so on. But to get tied up immediately in the in a governmental policy like that is was just kind of mind blowing to me, um, and, and I think that's where that history came from. And I, I find know. a difference between assimilating and converting versus being forced to For at sure. age five, For sure. being forced yeah. to pray right. in that way, right. rather than being raised in a faith that is loving and hopeful. And right. certainly, the Catholic faith is a beautiful faith. Yeah. It is. Yeah. I was raised in the Catholic faith, yeah. and yet, and there's also sinful the ways that it gets practiced too. You know, exactly. I mean, there's obviously redeeming and, and loving ways to do it, and then there's other instances throughout the history where it's where it's also corrupted, and that's why there's ongoing need for conversion within the church too, and within individuals. But the church as a whole is always needing to be reformed too. So that's another kind of theological principle. But but to know that that tie into the uh, governmental policy from the beginning was really just unbelievable to me when I first learned it. One of our struggles today is that we're so early in our work in truth-telling uh, that we have a lot of history to catch up on, right. a lot of stories that we need to hear, and yet we're always moving toward what do we do? Yeah. Uh, what do we do next? One of our questions, uh, one of our viewers said, I recently heard that the Benedictine sisters in Minnesota have apologized to indigenous people for the role in the history of boarding schools. Are there other groups connected to the Catholic Church who have done the same, or do you anticipate that others will make this move in the future? Yeah, I could, I could say a little yeah, bit, I, just I, from, yeah. actually I was on the phone last night with a Jesuit friend of mine out of Pine Ridge. Now, even at Pine Ridge, there's an initiative that has begun within Red Cloud Indian School, that used to be called Holy Rosary Mission, and back in the 70s, uh, they changed the name to Red Cloud Indian School, and now there's a, a graduate of the school, Macaw Black Elk, who's a descendant of Nicholas Black Elk, who went to Red Cloud, has taught there, and now is leading this Truth and Reconciliation effort uh, out, out of that school. Now he's going all over the country. In fact, he's going to be here in a couple of weeks in the Twin Cities speaking to the Jesuit novices, and I'm hoping to try to get him to come and speak at St. Thomas, too. 
but that's a combined effort from within the school and the Jesuit province uh, that is um, laying out, a re uh, first of all, starting with the research and understanding the stories and the narratives, and uh, that has to do with archival re research too, not unlike the effort with Georgetown and St. Louis U on, on the slavery reconciliation project. So methodologically, I mean, it's a similar, it's a long, it's a long process. I mean, there, it's ongoing process, but starting with knowing the history, letting the history be known, uh, digging deeper, understanding all the complexities of it. Now, where that goes as far as, um, and certainly there's been, there's been apologies too, and all kinds of different places from bishops and religious orders too. Um, but the beginning of a, a concerted effort to uncover uh, or retell history that's already been known by some but not paid attention to by others, as you indicated, um, that's, that's an ongoing process. And, and I think, uh, and some probably elements of um, a restorative justice practice, too. That's another thing that might be kind of interesting to note within St. Thomas at the law school. As, as some people might know, there's a whole restorative justice initiative that's launching from the law school that could be very applicable uh, within some of the um, issues around native and uh, boarding schools and different versions. Um, that that's, a, that's another resource that we've got that we might think about later on within St. Thomas to, to, to draw that practice that, is, that derives from indigenous practice, actually. Of when, there's a, when there's a wrong or a harm that's been done in any member of the community or a group of communities, than to have that painful encounter of having restorative justice uh, talking circles to, to, to acknowledge the pain and confront the pain and also hopefully come to um, some healing along the, along the way too. So anyway, that's another thing that maybe down the road we could try to look into to be a part of somehow or, or make some kind of contribution in it from the same time. Well, I think there's an analog here of wanting to know the story and move to action yeah. and maybe too quickly right toward right. talking yeah. about reconciliation right. Right. where we need to instead learn the story, do the truth telling, uh, do relationship building work. Right. Yeah? Okay. Uh, one of our uh, comments in the chat uh, is about Liz and the readings that you've suggested, Dr. Wilkinson, yeah. um, that we'll be collecting those and trying to make those available as a follow-up to this presentation. Uh, also, uh, Linda Lagarde Glover's short story collection, The Dance Boots, yeah. uh, is one that's been recommended here as well. Sure. Um, I could I, definitely provide a pretty in extensive okay. list for folks. And of course, we've got Birch Bark Books here in, mm -hmm. at Lake of the Isles with, I mean, who's, it's owned by Louise Erdrich, and uh, they have an extensive collection and are a great resource. And I want to take that, uh, that notion of story and come to another question in our chat. Uh, someone posted, as a granddaughter of a survivor of the Pipestone Boarding School, a White Earth Ojibwe grandmother. I tried to talk with her before her passing, but her fear of being disciplined was so great she never spoke about it. How do I, how do we, get past this fear of survivors to talk about their experiences? Uh, there's an appreciation for the discussion today and a desire to talk more about those experiences, to hear the complexity and reflections on the boarding school tradition. How do we get into those stories? Uh, I wonder if it's in part about the books that you've mentioned, uh, the way that we hear those stories indirectly. Yeah. I think uh, we get so many different perspectives, and we need to get so many different perspectives on the boarding school experience. And you can probably weigh in on this too, right? Because uh, if we think about it as this monolithic one thing, right, that happened in 1892, uh, then we're really missing mm -hmm. a lot because, uh, you know, uh, the boarding school era in the 1930s, 1940s was very different than the 1890s, was very different than the 1960s, right? And uh, impacted by the socioeconomic situation of the United States as a whole and different in different areas of the world. And I mean, I don't know that it gets to an answer to that question, but uh, I think that uh, well, I just remember, I, I published my um, review of Joy Harjo's Crazy Brave in the Star Tribune, and I mentioned that she had a positive experience at her 
boarding school, but that boarding school was the American Indian School of the Arts, right, um, in the 1960s, 1970s. Uh, and I got a handwritten letter back from a woman named Maxine, who at the time was 89, and uh, this was maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago, and she wanted to talk with me about her boarding school experience. And that led to a long series of meetings where she enlightened me about the very different experiences that people had. And she said she had had a positive experience and she knew all of the nuances of it. She was proud of her mother for being brave enough to send her there so that she could get the education and eat, you know, at a time when things were tough. And she still felt very connected to her nation. But that was 19, almost 1950 when she was there. Right, and so uh, I just think like the way to, to talk about it is to uh, read a lot from different eras and to know different people are differently impacted in s so many different ways. Um, and that n indigenous peoples were resisting and, you know, finding ways to subvert the system, which, you know, that's the part I love when I read these stories is all the different ways that, that people found to you know, maintain and reconnect. Um, but that's not to minimize those folks that couldn't, right? Like that for which the system was crushing, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't have an answer, yeah. right? But you know, that's, yeah. to me, that's helpful. I mean, the, the way you just laid out even the different eras and depending on which boarding schools you're talking about in different eras and how different things were operated by different places. That yeah. Letting, letting history remain and every individual story also stand on its own too. I think there's always, I always have a desire to try to make sense of everything or try to come up with some kind of grand narrative of understanding things and it just doesn't it certainly didn't work uh in my experience mm -mm. on the reservation and going with being there as a high school teacher and then later as a pastor i would hear just so many wildly different perspectives from the same people in the same communities i mean there i also had parishioners that that had I mean, she would. There were. There was a great parishioner that I had said our family would have starved if we hadn't been sent to the boarding school, and she had a great experience there. And then I'd go to a wake, and I'd meet somebody else, a different elder of the same generation, who had terrible experience. And yeah. so, and I, I, there was always just confusing to me, you know. And then try, you know, I want to try to understand the the whole, but there's there's just there's just an immense complexity in in, in I, this history, like any history yeah. too. And so, but I think you're. I just appreciate that about uh, the need to keep hearing all kinds of different stories and, and let them be honored and start with those stories. So. And I just, I guess I, I don't, I definitely want to make clear that like the, the initial aim of the boarding school system, you know, to eradicate Indianness, right, at its base, was eviscerating, right? And and I and for me, the base of that is loss of language, because from loss of language is loss of family, loss of culture, loss of identity, loss of connection, right? Which we, you know, and that ripple effect is all the negatives that you know we can we can point to today. I think. Um, and then I, you know, the the underlying story is the way that people navigated that and survivance. Right, which is you know Gerald Visner's survival plus resistance, right? Like survival plus resistance, which I think is super important to to talk about. And maybe that's the entry point, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how did you survive? How did you resist? Tell me those stories, right? Like maybe that's the. And I wonder if this the storytelling, this truth telling work, uh, also gets at another question for us from the audience about what St. Thomas is and will be doing to be able to represent these stories, to make uh, the little that we know and the complexity of what we know available to students, uh, to be able to engage our community in this work. 
uh, some sense about the, the work that's already happening, classes that are already available. I was going to say, take my class. <laughs> <laughs> say more about your class, Liz, and let's hear more uh, from spring, Jacob, too. Yeah, in the spring, I'm teaching uh, the Erdricks. I'm teaching uh, Louise and uh, Hyde Erdrich, um, and I'm going to teach uh, tracks and uh, the last report on the miracle at Little No Horse. And in every Native class, a Native literature class I teach, uh, I use a document called The Seven Eras of U.S. Native Relations. And, uh, you know, we just talk through the history, the contextual events that shape the way uh, Indigenous writers write. Yeah, uh, you can't read it without reading, without knowing the history. Hmm. Yeah. And I would say from, you know, from my perspective, also being new, coming back to St. Thomas and in this role, too, that would also have... Um, and a desire that I've got to to um, get to know in a broader way how does St. Thomas relate to the broader community, not just on the area of indigenous relations, but in all kinds of different ways and racial relations and education and so on. So I have, and we had a good chat about this last uh, few days ago about some possibilities. I, I would be very interested and I'm trying to begin to um, work on getting introductions to different people either around town or certainly even this some maybe there's some kind of connection that we could make with this truth and reconciliation project out in south dakota that perhaps we could have some kind of role but also it's also just mostly starting with with relationships and and what are what are the relationships that we do have already and and could if there's a desire from let's say at the tribal level or at more individual levels um i would i'm definitely eager to try to um, be introduced to some of those relationships and, and discern if, you know, build a relationship first and then see see what are the kind of constructive things that might be able to to emerge out of it. Again, without trying to leap to the to the conclusions or the resolutions too quickly either. I think it's a long it's a long term um, uh, process to try to uh, engage in relationship building and dialogue and, and ultimately discernment um, about about what are what are ways forward that could be that could be um, positive and healing and uh, and life-giving you know all the way around I don't know what that looks like but I, I definitely have the um, interest in in pursuing that and talking to different people about that so and dr. Jers, I know this is in your teaching purview but also uh, we've served on the land acknowledgement committee and there have been bigger thoughts about what it means for the university I wonder if you can uh, say a bit about that yeah and what I hope from this conversation that's already becoming apparent, this history is, is complex, it's nuanced. There's almost 600 federally recognized American Indian tribes in the United States, not including non-recognized, not including state-recognized tribes. This is a massive history. And that each one of these tribes has a different relationship with the United States, with the federal government, with state governments. And so we're acknowledging here that there's even time periods that are different within the boarding schools. Most of what my lecture focuses on is that early time period. What is the grounding framework for American Indian boarding schools? What was the reason for their being? What was the goal initially? And certainly they changed over a hundred years. The goals, the aims, the uh, faculty who were involved changed. And so it really should be a call to us, a call to action for listening to stories. Mm -hmm. I don't think that anyone deserves a survivor's story. I don't think you can demand such a story. That's not, not what we're looking for. So relationships are key. And that's something that I'd like to see the University of St. Thomas consider. In doing so, I hope that it's not a top-down approach where the university comes and says, we feel bad, we want to change how we feel. <laughs> Rather, you have to come humbly to such a conversation by noting, we recognize there's something wrong. We need to self-examine, we need to read indigenous authors as a uni collective university and recognize that while we did not perpetuate this history, it affects us. We are a part of this stream, of this river, of this conversation. And being a part of that means that you have to accept that the past does affect you. It does place you with the privileges you have or the disadvantages that you have. 
And so coming to uh, American Indian organizations, I think you say, we're a university. Here, here's what we do really well at. We're good at educating. You receive a strong education here at the University of St. Thomas. How can we use these educational skills for your nonprofit organization, uh, tribal governments? What skills are you looking for in students? How can we support your students? The University of Minnesota system just yesterday announced that they are offering tuition for all indigenous students. Now the push forward is that not only enrolled students, but students who are descendants, students who are recognized by their tribe as Native American, um, my hope is that the university expands towards that as well. This is something that the University of St. Thomas could explore. Yeah. Some sort of partnership with tribal colleges. Uh, perhaps you receive a, um, an associate's degree with the tribal college and finish off a bachelor's degree at the University of St. Thomas. Perhaps uh, language partnerships, uh, funding a program, a ling linguistics program. There's not a lot of PhDs in Ojibwe or Dakota within our area. That is a potential path forward. There are not a lot of indigenous faculty at the University of St. Thomas. We have some classes that are here, but not, not a lot. There's not a minor, there's not a major in American Indian studies. These are all avenues that we could potentially go. As um, Professor Klein mentioned, we were on the land acknowledgement statement, and I'm happy that we've done this work. But as I noted in the lecture, a land acknowledgement doesn't do a lot, it's words. The only thing that it does is create some sort of awareness that this happened. Ultimately, the actions that we take make the people that we are. So what actions will we go beyond recognizing? Educating ourselves has to be the next step. And I think working on the, the community that we do have now, and to ask the question honestly, I mean, is this the kind of place that Native students would want to come? That's a very good question. And that's, you know, I think we probably have a lot of work to do. I'm mindful of, you know, when I was teaching out at Red Cloud, it would bring students to Creighton, because I was a, a local, or relatively local uh, Jesuit university. But at the time, they didn't really have any kind of infrastructure to, to, to receive well and to, and to help support and so on native students. Now 10 years later or so, there was a, an investment within the university to uh, both on the scholarship level, but also a staff and support within the university that would make that place more attractive. And then they started to attract more more students from uh, from just from Red Cloud, for example. So but that's, a, that's a long process and to, to think about um, is it, it would be very difficult for at least coming from certain reservations be a very hard leap to make to both leave the reservation and go to a school like this uh, in, in the nature of the, the, the context and so on here. So that's, that's just challenging. And so that's also something that we, that we would, uh, I think, should always be looking at, not just with respect to Native students, but any other, you know, first generation students of any, of any kind from any kind of different background. That's, that's an ongoing process of trying to be, uh, work on, in the environment that is that is welcoming and inclusive and so on and all, on all kinds of different levels too. I think our conversation now is getting at a number of the questions that we've had in the chat about structural changes that much of uh, what gets talked about in boarding schools is sometimes personalized or individualized in abuse or in some of the the worst excesses of the schools but really questions about the structural element uh, as Dr. Wilkinson pointed out that this was a colonizing effort uh, that this was a larger structural kind of work that the boarding schools did. And so it requires a r structural response uh, mm -hmm. from us as a university. Although we weren't directly involved with boarding schools, uh, we have been involved with erasure uh, and with perpetuating the lack of information, the inability to be able to really engage with these issues. So uh, one of our comments, one of our questions is about St. Thomas as a Catholic institution. How might we take responsibility, and especially offering opportunities uh, to people who were affected by boarding schools? Uh, whether it's the uh, actual uh, uh, descendants who are in those boarding schools, the generations that have come since. Um, what, what can we do to not be an assimilating institution, but to change as an institution to better receive people from those communities? I think, you know, I think uh, some of those areas are, again, this is, at, as far as I know, and I'm, I'm relatively new coming back to the university too, um, 
we're, 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 we're at a very early stages of, of trying to even initiate many, many relationships uh, to the, that could be substantive, you know. So we, again, we can't come up with any big master plan if, if we don't have <laughs> uh, partners that want to even engage with us, you know. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of prior work of just relationship building that might be a certain kind of outreach to different schools. Locally, what does that look like? Uh, as you say, maybe transfer possibilities from Native students coming from tribal colleges. With that's that's an admissions question of strategy and outreach. There, there, even within the Catholic world. Like I went over to visit the the. There's a local parish that is focused on uh, tribal uh, uh, members and so on that are a part of the Catholic Church. So there's there's just so many different levels of trying to do that outreach that that we need to work on, so. And I'm sorry to say that we are at the end of our time, uh, mm -hmm. all the time that we have for questions today. There are remaining questions in the chat, and I know that we have work to do uh, that will make the list available uh, that uh, Dr. Wilkinson talked about for readings. Uh, we have a land acknowledgement page at the University of St. Thomas page that is under development. It's a, a start at trying to get at some of these topics of conversation. And knowing that we are at the first but urgent steps of truth-telling, relationship building, and justice doing. I want to thank our panelists today, uh, thank Dr. Jurors for your presentation, and thank everyone in the audience for joining us. We hope you found this year's first Teach in Tuesday informative. We'll see you on December 7th for next Teach in Tuesday with Xiaowu and Guan and Monica Leo presenting on anti-Asian American bias. On behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences, thank you for joining us.